gjërata e fundit për, për ditën e sotme, më thonë edhe në armat, është të njësit, para së sojnë mi, mi, mi falem dhe rrugë alushit që e ka portu më që me që me për, për dorë në armate, është të dhe yvën prej pre komunës të Prishtinës, fangë dhe shumë. Njësin, me njësin një mëftu me një vend të Aga Kalit në, në Dubaj dhe në Abu Dhabi. Dhe në minim në Dubaj e Abu Dhabi? One of those places. Ka që një shpërblimi i Aga Kalit, ku më pasën kratësin me, me boli technical review të një projekte që me sigurin njësi ka më të rebu edhe në një anë prisuatë dhe të gatë. Njëllësi është të thetës së arkitekt kryesor në zadi të arkitekt që mirët me projekte kulturore, është associate director, dhe të heqë cluster one, që është një në njësi e biznesit në zadi të arkitekt që mirët me objekte kulturore, se dhe është të thetës e bashkët e me ljus i kodë, pra të një organizatë në mrena zadi të arkitekt i cila mirët me Kujumtimi në mënyrë of treja të gjenerimit kodër edhe se i skripta të ndryshme kompjuterike për gjetje në formë of treja. Pa e zhjallë shumë, Nils, I would like to invite you. Begin for the introduction and uh, thanks for everyone for hanging in. Appreciate it. Late. <laughs> so, um, I think just a very quick overview of what we do. I, my name is Nils Fischer, I work for Zionian Architects, and these are kind of the buildings in uh, descending granularity that, that we work on. Um, and I really won't bother you too much with our projects. I will show some of them, but what I really want to discuss today is or what I intended to discuss today was something about icons, formalism and identity because um, a lot of our work attracts a lot of comments and this is usually the first thing we are challenged upon when presenting somewhere or when debating, so I thought I might as well tackle it head on and then after yesterday's presentation by Liam I got to think a bit about the role of the consumer that is certainly um, also quite a decisive one when it comes to decision making, making in architecture these days, particularly when you look at developers. So, kind of related with this uh, icons brand and identity because I think this starts to play an undeniable role in architecture for the good or for the bad. Um, and uh, yeah, and a little forward defense of formalism because I think it's not a new phenomenon. Um, to start with, um, this is clearly not one of our buildings and I apologize for the horrible quality. I think I've been a bit overly ambitious with my um, gadgets to connect here, so it's all a bit blurry tonight, but it's maybe not a bad thing. Um, I think most of you will know this building, which is uh, Frank Gehry's um, museum in Bilbao, which created an effect for them. And the question is, is it really created or, or wasn't that? I think for me that's more the entrance point of branding into architecture, because what this was was the beginning of a very smart series of franchises promoted by the Guggenheim Foundation, and uh, Thomas Krenz was at the time um, project director for this project, and later became the head of the Guggenheim Foundation where there was an enormous synergy created between uh, content of a building, destination value of the architecture, and a commercial proposition that went out of many cities. So there were a lot of follow-on projects and competitions coming from, from this original um, um, design, which, which obviously also our office benefited from and, and participated in. And it kind of stuck, kicked off a huge debate about identity and, and branding and architecture. I'm not so sure whether this is actually an icon because I still struggle to sketch it uh, from memory, um, but it's certainly um, a brand in itself and um, created um, a new view of, of perceiving architecture as a means of adding to the destination value of a place. There are some other accidental icons in architecture which are clearly uh, becoming synonymous for a place, and, and these are often not planned and uh, become. Um, what is probably something that often tries to be replicated in buildings, uh, with sheer accidents. Not sure whether that qualifies as a brand. And um, obviously, transplanting, it doesn't really recreate the effect. So um, looking at it from a very postmodern perspective, is the collage still architecture? Does it do the same thing? Um, but I think all of these kind of very iconic pieces somehow live in this dialectic between, let's say, a functional argument, 
that a building needs to deliver, and I think here the function is simply generating a lot of money as a destination value, and then a formalistic approach. I think that's really nothing new, and if you look at Las Vegas, you might as well go all the way back and look at pyramids, because these things kind of already have written over them. I'm in, I'm in a monument, and somehow predates the postmodernist uh, debate quite significantly. So I think this, this, this field of tension between, let's say, a formalist vision in architecture and the, the use of the building is, is as long as the history of architecture itself. And, um, well, I think it won't go away. Um, it's certainly not the most efficient form of a graveyard. Uh, but it clearly delivers on iconicity. Um, it clearly delivers on, 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 um, um, on, an, on an architectural statement and on an association with a destination. Would we build it again? Probably not. So um, I think there is a lot of scope for considering what the future of places in architecture will be in correlation to their identity. Um, yeah, we already had a quote of Marshall McLuhan earlier on mm -hmm. by Ethel and uh, Caesar. Um, I would also like to quote a colleague of mine, Jane May, he probably said around 2010 for, for this meaning, and I think that's kind of what, looking back at the work that the office that I work for has done, is probably summarizing it quite well. So, I mean, architecture doesn't happen by the sheer will of the architect. It always requires a conversation between a client and our domain is public buildings. I mean, this is the kind of work that we burn for. And uh, it then goes beyond the time. It, it really requires engaging with the community, with an audience, and uh, there always has to be, um, I think, a very strong attempt to convince people of architecture. I think good architecture has to be polarizing in order to see the light of day. Um, but it often also fails, of course, in the debate. That's why I think architectural competitions, for me, are still the most important means of identifying strong proposals. But I think at the end of the day, if you then aim high and, and, and shoot for a very strong statement, you also generate that, that surface that allows to um, create identity for a place. Um, which is maybe a quite nice connection to what Ivan said about the European identity. And because in this later part of my little presentation, I'll talk about where there's a real demand for um, identity um, generated that is really exceeding, I think, what we from a European perspective um, can, can uh, see and also possibly address. So, I mean, this is some of the stuff that we did. Some of them emerged to become kind of seen as synonymous with places or kind of promoted by those places. I mean, this is like quite fortunate cases. In all the cases, that doesn't really happen. Um, but I think there's a, particularly in Europe, there's a really good range of great projects that are very different on a formal level um, that kind of start or that, that really um, inform the place and, and its, its identity. So this is one of my favorite buildings, which is the Harper in, in Iceland uh, by Henning Larsen and Olaf O. Eliasson. It's very different from the kind of architecture we do, but it kind of is, is a nice example for how a cultural building informs a space. So it's, it's a bit off-center in, in, in Reykjavik and uh, turns what was a conversion of a trade harbor into a cruise ship harbor into kind of a second heart of the city. Um, or the uh, opera in, in Oslo by um, a um, very nice example of a piece of architecture becoming um, a public urban playground. So most of the visitors going to these buildings are not going there for the opera, they go there for the, the interaction of, uh, of uh, architecture and, and uh, city. Um, or the um, uh, Copenhagen Royal Danish Dead Playhouse. I mean, this is a very kind of sober piece of architecture, but it's fantastic at the end of the pedestrian zone uh, by Lundgaard and Frankberg. Um, I think also a very, very successful piece of, of, of architecture that informs the identity um, of a place. And um, of course, this is also what we attempt to do when technical competition. And uh, I just want to show briefly this project that we did for Krishna four and a half years ago, which was a competition for a um, central mosque. So, this little <laughs> cluster of shells, what you see there, is, is our design, what it looks like from a perspective driving into the city was inspired by looking at the typology of an Ottoman mosque, um, which is interestingly based upon a uh, uh, Byzantine church in, in, in uh, Istanbul, which eventually became the Hagia Sophia. So there's an interesting kind of twist in, in history when you look at, at uh, how these kind of shell clusters emerged in, 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 uh, in, in mosque architecture. And um, we then looked at the contemporary inspiration and uh, did a lot of formal research on sets of concrete chairs before by the work of Felix Candela and, and Fry Otto, and then came up with, with clusters that uh, necessar not necessarily um, um, 
are ideal shape-wise, but allow us to um, create a um, interpretation of the program in response to um, connections that go through the site. And a very important aspect about this particular task was that we didn't only want to build a mosque that works for um, the, the Muslim population, but that becomes a meaningful addition to the city. So the pathways through the site became quite important and were the generator for, for um, developing these clusters of shells, which were then kind of heavily optimized uh, to become lightweight and uh, structurally self-supporting. So there was a lot of precursor research that went into this proposal and um, there became a very uh, contemporary uh, view on what we believe um, most of you see the central passage that was uh, or was intended to go through the building. Part of the program, interestingly, were also the shops, so it was kind of extended, kind of integrated into the public realm. And um, yeah, I think this, this kind of would have been a quite nice take on a building that not only aims to uh, provide for a specific part of the community, but that then also develops an interface that can add and connect to um, all um, members of. Um, I think another very interesting example of successful public architecture and highly debated in the time of its making is the Elf um, in Harmony by Herzog de Mont. It was a super controversial project in Germany in the time of its making. Um, politicians lost their careers over it because it was um, a, a kind of hard to control budget. It was very naive in the beginning. I think it cost eight times as much as initially quoted. So um, for, for almost 10 years, highly debated. But the day it was finished, it turned into a massive success, and no one wants to ever look back and question the existence of that building. Um, booked out two years in advance, and uh, despite the city uh, complaining about going bankrupt over this project for, for many, many years, um, it's within a very short time, uh, uh, short time came a very um, uh, integral part of the identity of the place. Um, or another example, our first project that got us in China, the one the Opera House, um, which is quite interesting, because nowadays China is about third of our work, but it was a public building like that that got us into there. So comparably small by, by Chinese standards, um, but a building that was in the public realm and then got us the presence there that allows to, to expand our portfolio in that part of the world. So, from and then of course there are buildings which are absolutely unbeatable in terms of creating identity and symbolism, um, even though they are not really good in what they actually intended to be. Um, the City Opera House has been renovated twice for acoustic purposes to make it an even mediocre theater. Um, it is being shut down, I think, at the end of the year for another two years of renovation. 200 Australian bars pumped into it to um, make it work for the artists, but that doesn't really matter because every artist is still killed to, to play there once in a lifetime. You can go complete, um, yeah, synonymous building for um, a city that wasn't really on the map as a city with a picture um, before that building, and it's, it's one of these kind of very hard to plan successes that, that architecture can um, deliver um, in terms of destination making. And the reason why I show these buildings, and it's, it's has a bit of a contrast to what Ivan has been shown before as, as what, what the European <coughs> identity is with a lot of, of uh, appreciation of subtle public spaces is because there is a big demand for identity in places that are not grown but that are artificially created and um, speak about that a little bit later. But there are also places which are developing a strong sense of identity without necessarily being beautiful and, and planned as such. And this is the National Theatre, uh, the South End in London, this brutalist concrete building. Um, kind of had a very weird face in the 80s when the, when the, when the, when the uh, South Bend promenade was not really connected and there wasn't much going on at night, so, so they had a lot of, it kind of turned into an informal skate park. Um, but this became so much identity, or part of the identity of these buildings that the graffiti there are now being restored and protected. So this, Kind of a small example for architecture becoming um, an urban playground. And I think there are also buildings like that in Pristina, which have a very strong identity where the people are very attached to, where you look at them in the first place, wonder are they, are they really um, something that you want to carry forth into the future? But uh, I believe that, that there are a lot of uh, very iconic buildings in cities that are not necessarily classified as beautiful, but have this very strong identity that um, form part of um, a place's history. And uh, yeah, in London we also have examples like Lisa Barbie. Highly controversial from the day it has been built, but uh, I think it's still a prototypical um, uh, housing environment. Uh, I, I happen to live there and I quite enjoy it, I have to say. 
Um, and you find this in history. I mean, the Opera Garnier was called as a dress up tombstone by Corbusier by the time. He, um, uh, he reviewed it um, and it became synonymous uh, for opera. I mean, at the time, probably very opulent, um, already historicist when it was built. Um, it's it's uh, late 19th century. Um, but um, incredibly successful when it comes to um, uh, being a um, symbol for, for, for the, the opera as such almost. Um, and I think what all of these projects have in common is that at the time they're created, it's very unclear whether what, what comes out of them. And, and obviously the examples that I've shown are kind of standing out because we already know that they have stood the test of time. But I think what is important for the work of architects, and I think particularly um, um, uh, when you're a young architect as a, as a student of architecture, I think it's always important to aim high with your ambitions. Um, because if you start with a mediocre comp compromise at the outset, you, you almost immediately take the chance away of your project eventually um, becoming an integral part of the identity um, of a place. I think there's a very nice example of um, Zaha's um, early days as an architect where she was struggling to win competitions and this is actually a drawing of the first competition that she won which was for the uh, Cardiff Opera House. Um, was partially government funded, highly controversial and um, the debate at the time was is that a feasible job? And in the end of the day, she, she couldn't go through with it because there was an ambition to basically not value engineer but risk engineered to death to a degree where it would have just become um, a kind of nondescript piece of architecture. And what Cardiff went for in the end is this little thing here. And I mean, you be the judge. I'm not really sure whether that was that kind of risk management was helping the place to 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 emerge. Um, and um, Zaha summarized it quite well at the time that um, when your ambition is to build a supermarket, then you have a problem. So I think also when it comes to cities trying to redefine uh, public institutions, it's always very important to also keep in mind that uh, these buildings deliver more than their sheer content and um, that inviting architects to, to uh, compete for solutions is um, certainly generating um, um, results that have the chance to contribute positively to the environment. And the reason why I kind of talk about identity here and what buildings can contribute to the identity is that a lot of our built environment is more or less generic these days. And the problem that is underlying all of this is this curve, which is the population growth <laughs> of mankind. We are currently nowadays at 7.6 billion people and it doesn't end there. So we are in a phase of rapid growth of, of urban settlements and most of them will still have to be built as um, we are essentially still in the process of urbanization. So we're having two trends, which is global population growth and then still a massive urge of um, societies to move people from the countryside into the city, which is in regions of large growth like India and China far from complete. And um, there was, of course, the Corbusian approach to the mechanized um, Fordist city uh, with his uh, city radius and uh, Plan Gauzin that became the prototype or the, the big hope to deal with these um, uh, effects of growth um, in the early 20th century. But it turned out very soon that um, these buildings or these, these settlements suffered from a lack of identity that was essentially incompatible with the requirements of um, human beings as territorial animals because we seek that, that feature, that, that element of, of, of urban landscape that makes us feel home and that um, connects us to a place. And uh, yeah, Dan Jacobs luckily enough pre prevented big parts of Manhattan and, and Brooklyn to be turned into a modernist housing machine, but really the postmodernist debate didn't really stop modernism. And if you compare um, drawings of Corbusier for um, the Plan Rosin with what you find in many cities today, I think now, yeah, I lost the connection. So, I mean, this is just a vision of Corbusier, and this is how a big city in China looks like these days you see that this is still the predominant hypothesis on, on coping with uh, growth of mankind and providing shelter, which is a big um, challenge as well. And 
if you look at the uh, kind of hotspots of, of urban growth at the moment, you see that we have cities of unprecedented scale that have never really been consciously planned and that just grow. And if you look at the biggest settlement that we have on the planet today, which is the Pearl River Delta, it's this little green area there. Um, I mean, if you compare it to the scale of China, you kind of get an idea about what a mass of um, city we're talking here. And it's essentially um, eight cities growing together. So we have Hong Kong here, then we have Shenzhen, which was a fisher town of 30,000 inhabitants in 1979, because of what before it was made a free trade zone. This year, up there is Guangzhou, Canton. Down here we have um, Macau, and then in the middle we have a whole belt of, 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 of technology and fabrication that eventually turned into uh, dwellings for workers and then grew together into this massive agglomeration of 140 million people. Uh, right now there's a bridge under completion here, should open next month, connecting Macau and Hong Kong. So this eventually goes full circle. And, um, and this is really the reality of, of how the bigger part of mankind will live in, in the not too near or even present time in the not too near future. And it doesn't really stop there. So this is a map showing the um, nitrogen oxide emissions um, over China. And you see that here, little, the little area that I've been pointing out earlier, that's number three there below. That's here the Pearl River Delta. This is the cluster reaching uh, from Shanghai almost to Nanjing, almost forming one urban carpet. And then we have this zone here, which is a massive industrial carpet between Beijing and Tianjin here and Hebei about here um, becoming the next big um, mega city um, of China and uh, the government has now um, basically declared a development plan to formalize what is an unstoppable development anywhere so this is photograph north south this here is Beijing you kind of see the kind of very rigid structure with the uh, north southerly aligned city grid, and then here you have the harbor town of Tianjin, where currently the world's biggest uh, container, deep water container terminal is being built, and this entire corridor is now aimed to be developed into a mega city of 130 million inhabitants by 2050, and infrastructure is already on the way, so we are right now building a second airport for Beijing here, so the first one is what you see here, and here we are now building the second one because the first one only opened in 2008, it's already at capacity. Um, that's our design proposal for that, it's coming up very quickly, it's meant to open in two years time, that's kind of how the structure looks like at the moment, and it goes on like that, and you have cities that you may have not heard 10 years ago, like Chongqing, which now have already reached 20 million inhabitants, and uh, there are many, many more to come, and at the end of the day, what the reality is for, for people living in these cities are these kind of very standardized, highly efficient housing machines that form the backbone of, um, of the life in these cities. And, um, and all of these places, and these are just kind of, kind of randomly grabbed landmarks of kind of emerging places, um, um, have um, an, an inherent, inherent demand for, for identity. And you see how, how there's, a, there's a demand for architecture that delivers that. If it's good or not, I'm, I'm not judging, but there is a whole category of, of, of um, identity building going on and, and um, significantly informing the place, uh, the way that people read their cities apart from fairly standardized and monotonous um, housing environments. Um, what is quite interesting is, though, that in, particularly in China, there's hardly any um, intellectual debate about how these cities evolve. So the Chinese Army Guard at the moment is on a trip to the countryside, I would say. So if you, sorry, this is a bit slow here. Um, hmm? ah, here we go. So that's the that's work of, of, of Wang Shu or ATL. So it's all about rediscovering the, the, the vernacular identity, uh, finding, finding, uh, finding interpretations or languages for architecture that is Dealing with the land, land, uh, with, uh, with life on the country in China, but that's not really um, where the problem is. So there is a there is a certain degree of escapism at the moment um, going on and leaving um, what is really um, an unprecedented construction boom up to industrialized planning institutes, which are government-owned, working with big Western men or master planners, and essentially changing the face of the planet for the next hundreds of years because um, this won't go away. And if you look at the population curve that I've been showing earlier on, you will see that it flats out. So there's this 
massive push of urban growth that we see with two overlapping trends, uh, growing population and growing urbanization, that is creating hundreds of cities with in, ex uh, in excess of a million um, inhabitants um, that um, are currently almost um, zones that are escaping the architectural debate. And uh, yeah, and this is then typically how, how new urban centers look like. They're super efficient from a traffic point of view. Um, they deliver great commerce. Um, and they're almost like cookie cutters built for millions of people at the moment in China. And there's a headline for these developments. They're traffic-oriented developments because transportation is a uh, very important factor at the moment. Uh, funny enough, uh, in German, that means death. Um, and um, what is also very interesting about these cities is that they are all built very efficiently but on an outdated paradigm because they're all built around the um, automotive mode of transportation, whilst China at the moment is already um, on track to completely replace um, 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 the individual automotive transportation in the cities. Shenzhen just bought 20,000 electric buses, um, more or less, overnight, and uh, at the same time there are massive urban structures built around a uh, transportation infrastructure that is soon to be outdated. So I think there is a lot to do when it comes to rethinking the way these cities are being built. And there's a lot of scope for architects to get involved because, again, as I said, the, the, the architectural debate is not really looking at, in my view, what is going on at that scale of construction. And this is a very significant driver for how cities look like. And if you then cluster these developments over larger mass events, this is kind of what you get. And these mega cities are interestingly Uniform, so it doesn't really matter which part of the world you look at. They all kind of are this kind of random aggregation of 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 kind of efficient developments. And uh, Patrick Schumacher called that the uh, urban garbage spill. And it's kind of interesting how these uh, patterns come together. So this is almost becoming a zone uh, um, or um, um, a sphere where where there is hardly any design intent more anymore when you look at it at, at large scale. And this is quite concerning. But then at the same time, um, it's, it's a massive challenge and a massive task for, for future or also current generations of architects to get involved in. And I mean, very quickly, just showing something that may not look that different to you if you look at it, but this is a project that we did two months ago for a two and a half million people extension to Wuhan. Um, it's already starting to be built at rapid speed. Um, and um, it's, it's basically an attempt to just get involved and try to inform the data. I mean, you obviously have all the constraints that all the others have. So we have kind of super horrific existing infrastructure lines that cannot be questioned. There's a highway system that needs to be connected to, to even though it may be completely outdated in the 20th time. But what we are trying to do now is to actually question how, how for example, transportation infrastructure can, can emerge. So we are working on polycentric cities. So what you see here is kind of Manhattan-like density kind of contrasted by Green Island, so the idea is that in 10 years you are not taking account of the city anyway, so we may as well make the road smaller for starter, bring up densities, have more walkable uh, distances, and then reconnect these sub-centers with highly efficient uh, mass transportation systems. So this is kind of a very recent attempt to, to kind of become part of that, that debate and inform it. We are collaborating now with, with a few Chinese design institutes to, to um, get into that um, discussion. And it doesn't really end there. If you look at this slightly overexposed map, um, the darkness you see that is population density. Um, China has an urbanization goal of 80% until 2050. We are now at 56%. So even if the population plateaus at 1.4 billion, you still are about 340 million people, or cities for 340 million people short in China nowadays. And um, the biggest problem really will be India in the near future because within the next two years, India's population will exceed China's. They have a very diff different demographic structure. It will go up to 1.7 billion um, until 2050. And uh, India is only 36% urbanized. Um, and the only way to actually deal with the sheer infrastructure of, of feeding a population that large is to move them into city and cities. And all of these places will still need to be designed. And at the end of the day, also require um, something that is delivering identity to their um, inhabitants. Um, future sense of growth are here also uh, Nigeria and Africa um, with a very interesting demographic development. Indonesia will go through the roof soon. So, so there is a lot of identity and um, urban environment um, to invent. And, and I believe that's uh, 
the really big challenge for the coming generation of architects to um, to find ways to almost synthesize that what Ivan has uh, uh, very uh, um, uh, vividly shown in his uh, video as the European identity. So there are a lot of spaces yet to be built that don't have an identity yet at all, which are kind of blank slates. And China at the moment has 160 cities in excess of 1 million inhabitants, and this number will double. So there will be 160 more cities built from the scratch that um, will all become home to uh, a very, very large a very large number of local communities. Um, yeah, so a lot of work to do, and I think, particularly for architecture students, that that kind of scale of thinking is, is is very important to become involved in because there's so much work to do, and at the moment, it's kind of left to uh, to an almost um, mechanized way of, of producing cities. So um, there's a lot of space for for good and strong ideas um, that can be uh, put up for discussion. Um, that's where I end, and uh, look forward to a hopefully interesting debate, if we still have time for that. Yeah. <laughs>